through the air over this, the most beautiful spot on earth. This day of inspection ended with an enormous banquet in honor of all who had labored to create this garden of Edenic beauty and grandeur. And again, late into the night of their third day, this son and his mate walked in the garden and talked about the immensity of their problems. On the fourth day, Adam and Eve addressed the garden assembly. From the inaugural mount they spoke to the people concerning their plans for the rehabilitation of the world, and outlined the methods whereby they would seek to redeem the social culture of Urantia from the low levels to which it had fallen as a result of sin and rebellion. This was a great day, and it closed with a feast for the council of men and women who had been selected to assume responsibilities in the new administration of world affairs. Take note, women as well as men were in this group, and that was the first time such a thing had occurred on earth since the days of Dalmatia. It was an astounding innovation to behold Eve, a woman, sharing the honors and responsibilities of world affairs with a man, and thus ended the fourth day on earth. The fifth day was occupied with the organization of the temporary government, the administration which was to function until the Melchizedek receivers should leave Urantia. The sixth day was devoted to an inspection of the numerous types of men and animals. Along the walls, eastward in Eden, Adam and Eve were escorted all day, viewing the animal life of the planet, and arriving at a better understanding as to what must be done to bring order out of the confusion of a world inhabited by such a variety of living creatures. It greatly surprised those who accompanied Adam on this trip to observe how fully he understood the nature and function of the thousands upon thousands of animals shown him. The instant he glanced at an animal, he would indicate its nature and behavior. Adam could give names descriptive of the origin, nature, and function of all material creatures on sight. Those who conducted him on this tour of inspection did not know that the world's new ruler was one of the most expert anatomists of all Satania and Eve was equally proficient. Adam amazed his associates by describing hosts of living things too small to be seen by human eyes. When the sixth day of their sojourn on earth was over, Adam and Eve rested for the first time in their new home in the east of Eden. The first six days of the Rancha adventure had been very busy, and they looked forward with great pleasure to an entire day of freedom from all activities. But circumstances dictated otherwise. The experience of the day just passed, in which Adam had so intelligently and so exhaustively discussed the animal life of Urantia, together with his masterly inaugural address and his charming manner, had so won the hearts and overcome the intellects of the garden dwellers, that they were not only wholeheartedly disposed to accept the newly arrived son and daughter of Jerusalem as rulers, but the majority were about ready to fall down and worship them as gods. 4. The First Upheaval That night, the night following the sixth day, while Adam and Eve slumbered, strange things were transpiring in the vicinity of the Father's temple in the central sector of Eden. There, under the rays of the mellow moon, hundreds of enthusiastic and excited men and women listened for hours to the impassioned pleas of their leaders. They meant well, but they simply could not understand the simplicity of the fraternal and democratic manner of their new rulers and long before daybreak the new and temporary administrators of world affairs reached a virtually unanimous conclusion that Adam and his mate were altogether too modest and unassuming. They decided that divinity had descended to earth in bodily form, that Adam and Eve were in reality gods, or else so near such an estate as to be worthy of reverent worship. The amazing events of the first six days of Adam and Eve on earth were entirely too much for the unprepared minds of even the world's best men. Their heads were in a whirl. They were swept along with a proposal to bring the noble pair up to the Father's temple at high noon, in order that everyone might bow down in respectful worship and prostrate themselves in humble submission. And the garden dwellers were really sincere in all of this. Van protested. Amadon was absent, being in charge of the guard of honor which had remained behind with Adam and Eve overnight. But Van's protest was swept aside. He was told that he was likewise too modest, too unassuming, that he was not far from a god himself, else how had he lived so long on earth, and how had he brought about such a great event as the advent of Adam? And as the excited Edenites were about to seize him and carry him up to the mount for adoration, 
Van made his way out through the throng, and, being able to communicate with the Midwayers, sent their leader in great haste to Adam. It was near the dawn of their seventh day on earth that Adam and Eve heard the startling news of the proposal of these well-meaning but misguided mortals, and then, even while the passenger birds were swiftly winging to bring them to the temple, the Midwayers, being able to do such things, transported Adam and Eve to the Father's temple. It was early on the morning of this seventh day, and from the mount of their so recent reception, that Adam held forth an explanation of the orders of divine sonship, and made clear to these earth minds that only the Father and those whom he designates may be worshipped. Adam made it plain that he would accept any honor and receive all respect, but worship never. It was a momentous day, and just before noon, about the time of the arrival of the seraphic messenger bearing the Jerusalem acknowledgment of the installation of the world's rulers, Adam and Eve, moving apart from the throng, pointed to the Father's temple and said, Go you now to the material emblem of the Father's invisible presence, and bow down in worship of him who made us all, and who keeps us living. And let this act be the sincere pledge that you never will again be tempted to worship anyone but God. They all did as Adam directed. The material son and daughter stood alone on the mount with bowed heads, while the people prostrated themselves about the temple. And this was the origin of the Sabbath-day tradition. Always in Eden the seventh day was devoted to the noontide assembly at the temple. Long it was the custom to devote this day to self-culture. The forenoon was devoted to physical improvement, the noontime to spiritual worship, the afternoon to mind culture, while the evening was spent in social rejoicing. This was never the law in Eden, but it was the custom as long as the Adamic administration held sway on earth. 5. Adam's Administration For almost seven years after Adam's arrival, the Melchizedek receivers remained on duty. But the time finally came when they turned the administration of world affairs over to Adam and returned to Jerusalem. The farewell of the receivers occupied the whole of a day, and during the evening the individual Melchizedeks gave Adam and Eve their parting advice and best wishes. Adam had several times requested his advisers to remain on earth with him, but always were these petitions denied. The time had come when the material sons must assume full responsibility for the conduct of world affairs. And so, at midnight, the seraphic transports of Satania left the planet with fourteen beings for Jerusalem, the translation of Van and Amadon occurring simultaneously with the departure of the twelve Melchizedeks. All went fairly well for a time on Urantia, and it appeared that Adam would, eventually, be able to develop some plan for promoting the gradual extension of the Edenic civilization. Pursuant to the advice of the Melchizedeks, he began to foster the arts of manufacture with the idea of developing trade relations with the outside world. When Eden was disrupted, there were over one hundred primitive manufacturing plants in operation, and extensive trade relations with the nearby tribes had been established. For ages, Adam and Eve had been instructed in the technique of improving a world in readiness for their specialized contributions to the advancement of evolutionary civilization. But now they were face to face with pressing problems, such as the establishment of law and order in a world of savages, barbarians, and semi-civilized human beings. Aside from the cream of the earth's population assembled in the garden, only a few groups here and there were at all ready for the reception of the Adamic culture. Adam made a heroic and determined effort to establish a world government, but he met with stubborn resistance at every turn. Adam had already put in operation a system of group control throughout Eden, and had federated all of these companies into the Edenic League. But trouble, serious trouble, ensued when he went outside the garden and sought to apply these ideas to the outlying tribes. The moment Adam's associates began to work outside the garden, they met the direct and well-planned resistance of Caligastia and Dalagastia. The fallen prince had been deposed as world ruler, but he had not been removed from the planet. He was still present on earth and able, at least to some extent, to resist all of Adam's plans for the rehabilitation of human society. Adam tried to warn the races against Caligastia, but the task was made very difficult because his arch-enemy was invisible to the eyes of mortals.